Hi. Hello. Um, I'm going to read four poems. And the first one is called After the Deluge. When your balcony drain is clogged with leaves and three inches of rain fall in a few hours and water flows under the balcony door whose weather stripping was removed unbeknownst to you by the painter last summer. When the water floods office and bedroom, then drains into the, the hall and dining room downstairs, filling the chandeliers like vases and staining the ceilings whose paint now hangs loose like curling sheets of ancient parchment. When the water reaches the handmade rug, a 10 by 14 harees in maroon, rose, white, blue, and green, which you bought at an auction last month, sending your equity line of credit to Andromeda. When the person you hire to clean the rug soaks it with a chemical that smears green dye into the white background, and you wake at 3 a.m. to contemplate what you're going to say in court. When you claw futilely at the locked gates of sleep, forcing yourself not to think about the rug and find you're obsessing instead about the awful evaluations from the students you couldn't please and the Macintosh crammed with unpublished manuscripts. When you return home after meeting with an oriental rug expert to find your basement flooded and water approaching your daughter's bedroom. When the basement carpet mildews even after water extraction and treatment with antimicrobial chemicals and the mildew spores are sucked into the heater intake and blown all through the house by the central heating system. Forget the pills and gun. Think instead of me trying to prove the value of the Harees, explaining to the chair how I'm going to change the course, revising the manuscripts, running a drainage hose to the backyard, consulting foundation contractors. And I will think of you, a fellow passenger in this life, which is no Caribbean cruise, but more like an 80-year voyage on the Titanic. In the end, all will be lost, including your life and mine, but there are no other ships, so open that bottle of wine. The water's receding a bit, and we're traveling together. And this one is called Letter to Send in a Space Capsule. And it's addressed to intelligent beings um, in a distant galaxy, perhaps millions of years in the future. Letter to Send in a Space Capsule. I lived on the third planet circling an ordinary star at the edge of a spiral galaxy two million light years from the Andromeda Nebula. We called it Earth. In spring, the mock cherry trees were flocked with white blossoms when maples blazed green, and hummingbirds with long, narrow beaks and brilliant throats sucked nectar from red and orange flowers. In summer, the sky was pale blue and sometimes feathered with clouds like the wings of giant swans. When our star, known as the sun, was at its peak, the pavement of our streets began to sizzle, forming black tar beads and ice cream, sweet and sticky, dripped from children's cones. As the earth tipped away from the sun, maple trees turned red, liquid ambers gold, and falling leaves swirled in every gust of wind. When no leaves clung to the trees, the year's final season arrived like a bride, adorning the world with ice and white lace. The planet was mostly covered with oceans that filled great basins surrounding continents and islands that rose green and lush from the radiant water that surged and frothed at every shore. 
I was born 20 centuries after the birth of a prophet. Many considered the son of the creator of the earth, the heavens, and everything living. My species, Homo sapiens, was one of many warm-blooded creatures with four limbs, a backbone, and enamel teeth. Our brains were large, and we figured out how to shatter atoms and even fuse nuclei, releasing energy like the heart of a star. We built enough nuclear bombs to incinerate or irradiate all life and fill the atmosphere with ash. Needless to say, most people didn't want to use them, but we spoke many languages and lived by different customs and nations that couldn't reach agreement often waged war. As we burned fossil fuels to run our factories and cut down forests to build our towering cities, the earth grew warmer, the, the air turned grayer, and the polar ice caps crumbled into the sea. One by one, flowers, frogs, worms, and birds began to disappear. It may sound strange, but most people care deeply about the planet and each other. This is what I know. The language in which I write is English, a strongly stressed Indo-European tongue with regional variations and peculiar spelling. I hope the clapper rail with its brown and white striped belly still inhabits the salt marsh and the scarlet bugler still blooms each spring in the coastal hills of California, my home. I hope the rain still falls on forests and rivers. I hope you can decipher this code. And the, uh, the next one is called Birding, a Love Poem. I offer you the tundra swans rising in my hazel eyes, each with a yellow spot on its black bill heading toward the horizon, honking all along my auditory nerves with long necks outstretched. I give you my heart, its wings, beating like a flock of snow geese to send blood through my aorta. They shimmer in morning light before turning east and drifting to earth like a rain of gems. Please take my fears, frenzied as a hundred red-winged blackbirds swooping in chaotic patterns as they fly from my amygdala singing their squeaky song and land in a stand of tall reeds. My obsessions and sorrows, those awkward ducks that waddle on islands in my mind, quacking and whistling, are yours also. Each has its beauty, a blue wing patch, a white crown, and emerald head. Nor can I withhold from you my vanity, preening itself like a sandhill crane at the edge of my retina. You'll find it in flocks, alternately gliding and flapping, its rattling call filling my throat. My anger, that red-tailed hawk perched on a tree in my cerebrum, I offer more reluctantly. Its talons are sharp, its call a high scream. I confess that even I dislike it as it circles, then dives for its prey. My love is yours for the taking, of course, a meadowlark on a rock on a grassy hill in early December, its yellow breast and black bib pulsing softly. It won't stray far. This is its year-round range. I surrender my molecules, too, swirling in flocks, layer upon layer in my cells, like so many birds with hollow bones and rapid hearts, heading south, the air full of wings, dazzling, alive with offerings. And um, I'll just uh, read one more poem, and I'm going to conclude with a short one. Uh, this is a sonnet called Describing the Monarchs. Too bad that bloom is overused, you say 
as we stand beneath a eucalyptus tree, your arm around me, head bent back to see the monarchs celebrating New Year's Day. And burn is wrong, and rust suggests decay, but I like bless, a thousand blessings cling, each with white spots on black and orange wings, to branches unaccustomed to such beauty. But burn they do, each tiny beating flame lights up the tree, a bloom that's made of fire, flickering in winter to proclaim, a leaf gives solace, milkweed sates desire. They smolder, cool as rust, in spangled air, then fly like sparks, illumining the year. So, thank you, and happy Jack Foley Day, everyone. <laughs>